To be or not to be? That is the question. Hamlet. Or was that Macbeth? For the answers to this and a lot more, join me in England's historic countryside. Exploring castles in the country. Wow. Welcome to Laura McKenzie's Traveler. Oh my gosh, a beautiful day in England. It's warm, it's sunny, it's gorgeous. We are so lucky. Hi, I'm Laura McKenzie, and welcome to the English countryside. Now, what comes to mind when I say that? Thatched roofs, country lanes, horses, castles, the local pub, a lot of little towns and villages you may or may not know. Well, today we're gonna go exploring and hopefully discover something new. So, get ready, we're gonna have a great time. Right over there, a castle. Did I say a castle? There are definitely more than that, and not just castles. English country homes run from the ostentatious to quaint and practical, and luckily for us, many of them are located just a quick car or train ride from London. Now you can take a train, but I'll give a rental car a try. Not only do I get to practice driving on the left-hand side of the road, but I also get to see some interesting small towns along the way. And the best part about these towns is that they all have a claim to fame from a cathedral to a castle. But if you're looking for an attraction of Shakespearean proportions, then you have to go to Stratford-upon-Avon. What I love is a lot of the towns here in England are multi-named. Stowe in the Walt, Shipston on Stourd, Stratford upon Avon. What it means is the second word is usually the river, the Wold, the Stour, the Avon. Those are rivers. Stratford upon Avon. That's the town of Stratford upon the river Avon. Get it? But what is it that makes Stratford upon Avon such a big attraction? Hmm. Well, it might have something to do with a famous poet and playwright who went to school here, lodged his wife here, and was born here. Wow. William Shakespeare's house. This is it. The birthplace of the man himself. He was born April 23rd, 1564, almost 450 years ago, and he lived in this house until he was almost 18 years old. I mean, seeing this and being here takes it out of the history book and makes it come alive. This is great. Well, this has always been known from a, an early time as the room that Shakespeare was born in. Astonishingly, within about 70 years of his death, the very first visitors we know from their letters were already being shown it as a sort of place of pilgrimage. Indeed, this has continued through the 18th and 19th centuries to include visits from Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, um, later Byron, Keats, Thackeray, Charlie Chaplin. We really could name many more. Recently, the rooms in the house were refurbished to resemble what they would have looked like in Shakespeare's time. And most visitors are surprised at how bright and cheerful they are. This historic building not only commemorates Shakespeare and his writings, it also sheds some light on his father and his father's profession. Well, this is actually his workshop where the gloves would have been made, cutting out, assembling, the tanning, because he was a tanner as well, would have been done behind the property. That's the less savoury part of the business. It's very smelly. The baskets of wool that we've got here remind us that Shakespeare's father expands his business into selling wool. We know that he also sells timber and grain. While Shakespeare's father was once quite the entrepreneur, today it seems that everyone is finding a way to make money in Stratford-upon-Avon. Everything here is a Shakespeare theme, the As You Like It Cafe, the Macbeth Bookstore, the Shakespeare Inn. You get the idea, it's pretty touristy. But the basis for all that tourism is real. It's Shakespeare, his works, his plays, his life. So if you kind of dig through all that touristy stuff, I think you're gonna find something special. One of the best ways to enjoy Shakespeare is to walk through Bancroft Gardens. This is a great place to come face to face with the master or sit back and read one of his works. Ah, it was Hamlet. But one of my favorite things to do in Stratford doesn't have anything to do with Shakespeare. It is so beautiful on the river here. You can come and feed the geese and the swans and the ducks. You know what? They'll eat right out of your hand. Come here, sweetie. There you go, yeah. But when you're on the River Avon, you don't wanna just stand on the shore. 
I'd much rather go punting. What's punting, you say? Punting is all about being leisurely on the river, sitting on some nice soft cushions close to the water and enjoying yourself. Oh, it's very comfortable. I'm having a great time. I've always heard about punting on the River Avon, so this is it, and I'm really glad we had a chance to do this. This is not only a relaxing ride, it's also a great way to see some of the sights without the crowds. So this is the, the big theatre here. Yeah. There is more than one theatre in there, I understand. There are three theatres in Stratford, two here on the riverside, one behind the other, the original theatre from the 1930s and the, the Swan Theatre behind it. But there's also a further theatre about 200 metres down river, which they use for modern plays. Now, is it difficult to get tickets to the, to the theatre? No, it's very easy, particularly because they always keep some tickets back to be sold on the day. So even if you're here for one day, you can pretty well guaranteed to, to get a ticket. Ah, punting on the Avon. Now this is the life. But you don't have to go to Stratford to enjoy it, because people punt all along the Avon. In fact, I hear Oxford is a great place for punting. But Oxford is more than just a pretty riverside town. It's the home to thousands of British scholars. It's also the alma mater of 13 Nobel Prize winners, several prime ministers, numerous literary icons, and now this handsome fellow. His parents must be so proud. The exact start date for Oxford University is unknown, but the general belief is that the school opened in the 13th century after Paris's universities closed their doors to British scholars. Today, Oxford has 39 federated colleges attached to it and a long and prestigious history. Plus, the campuses are beautiful to boot. Here's a tip. Driving times may take longer than they look on paper due to narrow winding roads off the main motorways. Laura McKenzie's Traveler. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And for more information on Great Britain, go to lauramackenzietv.com. Oh, if you could just smell the air, I love it at the beach. Just the sea and the sand and the salt and waffles and cotton candy and fish and chips. Ah, it's great. By the sea, by the sea, by the beautiful sea. And to really be by the sea, there's no better place to go than the famous Brighton Pier. They've got games and food and shopping. It's a lot of fun for the kids. And the big guys, too. But if you prefer to sit back and soak in the sun and play in the sand, well, you're kind of out of luck. Let's take a minute and define beach. This is not the sugar white sand you may have imagined. Here in Brighton, it's rocks. Now, how do you make a sandcastle out of this? What's that? Beaches and boardwalks are not your thing? Well then, I hope you like shopping, because Brighton has everything you could ever want, from bistros and bars to baubles and breastplates. I've been looking all over for this. But you won't have to search all over for the must-buy in Brighton, because it's everywhere. Oh, I can't leave here without my Brighton Rock. What is Brighton Rock, you say? It's the famous candy. It's kind of like a big candy cane, but the name Brighton Rock is boiled all the way down the stick. So no matter how you slice it, you always see the name. Clever. Not just smart, it's also delicious and a great present to take home to your friends. All this shopping has made me pretty hungry, and while I could eat a whole bag of Brighton Rock, I think I'll try something else here that's also so terribly British fish and chips. Now, how do you come to Brighton without trying fish and chips and steak and kidney pie? It's tradition. Fish and chips have been a British tradition for decades. And being that England is surrounded by water, it's not surprising that fish would be their national fast food. Now, you'll find different kinds of fish to go with your chips. There's haddock, place, occasionally skate, hake, and dogfish. But the traditional variety is cod. Chips are easy to explain. They're big French fries. Ah, but don't forget the salt and vinegar. That makes it British. What kind of vinegar? Vinegar with onion vinegar. Onion vinegar, okay. Right, you try one, Okay. and you see what you think. Hmm. 
Really? Nice. Oh, nice. Well, we take this to America and everybody likes it. Mm. Definitely. Mm. Better than ketchup. Yeah. Hey, don't forget my fish. Fish are better now. Oh, that looks good. How'd you get it to fluff up like that? That looks great. Look at that. Look oh, that looks gorgeous. See that? Loaded with salt, this may not be a dish for the health conscious, but we're on vacation, so it's okay to splurge. Really good. Hmm. I'd get so fat here. <laughs> ah, I love being by the sea. Makes me want to get out on the water. Yes, I guess you could say I'm a boat lover. In fact, one of the most famous boats in England is docked at our next location, the HMS Victory, in the seaside town of Portsmouth. This historic ship was once the working residence of Lord Nelson. You know, the guy on top of Nelson's column in London's Trafalgar Square? Anyway, he's a national hero here in England. He was the British Admiral that led the Royal Navy to victory against the French during the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. Unfortunately for Lord Nelson, he was shot during this battle. Lord Nelson, at the height of the battle, and he was on the quarter deck of his ship directing the battle in full uniform, and he was struck by a sniper from the masthead of the ship alongside him, a, a French musketeer got him. He was hit through the shoulder, the, the ball, musket ball went down, I believe, through his lungs and shattered his spine, lowering his body, and he collapsed to the deck. But he lived long enough to know that his fleet had defeated the French, and he had, in his own words, done my duty. Today, you can explore the HMS Victory. And if you like ships, then boy, is Portsmouth the town for you. Besides the HMS Victory, Portsmouth is home to the HMS Warrior, the Mary Rose, and two-thirds of the Royal Navy's surface ships. This historic dockyard is a truly amazing place and uh, shows a continuous development of the Navy over, over really uh, one millennium. If you want to see a ship that played a major role in the development of modern warships, then you'll need to take a tour of the HMS Warrior. You can think of her as the missing link of ship evolution. She was the first ironclad battleship, and she's both a sailing and a steam-powered vessel. But enough about her design. I enjoyed seeing how her crew lived. It seems pretty cramped, and I definitely wouldn't want to sleep here. Here's a tip, make sure to ask what petrol your rental car uses, gasoline or diesel, as you'll break down if you use the wrong fuel. Laura McKenzie's Traveler, we'll be right back. Welcome back, and for more information on Great Britain, go to lauramackenzietv.com. When visiting the English countryside, I usually base myself in London and take day trips and excursions to towns and attractions outside the city, so I don't have to pack and move all the time. And I know there are a lot of hotel choices in London, but I always seem to go back to the same one, the Athenaeum Hotel and Apartments, right in the heart of everything. It's where you're always welcomed home like family. From the moment you arrive, you're impressed with the atmosphere. It's sophisticated, yet very comfortable and welcoming. Rooms are beautifully decorated in designer fabrics with several different decors to choose from, and styles range from English chintz and antiques to rooms with a more contemporary feel. For those times you need a little extra space, one of the Athenaeum suites is the perfect choice with various sizes and decors to choose from too. And you gotta love those marble bathrooms. So on your next trip to London, the Athenaeum Hotel and Apartments is the perfect place to stay and where you'll always hear the words welcome home after returning from your excursion into the English countryside. Now I promised castles and I'm going to deliver on that promise with one of the most impressive castles left in England, Arundel. Construction on this castle began in the 9th century, but most of the structure was destroyed during the English Civil War. It wasn't until the 18th and 19th century that the castle was renovated to its original glory. Though it's hard to believe, Arundel has been in the hands of the same family since 1102. The Duke actually still lives here. 
Can you imagine owning all of this for nearly a millennium? And if you think the building's impressive, check out the view. I can just envision the knights fighting in the courtyard. Oh, no, no, guys, no, 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 no fighting over me. There's plenty to go around, please, please. You know, when people think of medieval history, they think of knights in armor and damsels in distress. But you know what? It was a lot more than that. Life was tough. Winter's here, cold. And without today's modern conveniences, even the wealthy didn't have it that easy. Most people didn't live like lords and kings, so it's hard to imagine how the commoners survived through the centuries. One place to get an idea of what life was like even 200 years ago is just down the road at the Weld and Downland Open Air Museum. You know, for a city girl like me to get out in the country and see what life was like back in the 17 or 1800s, now that's really special. And the fact that these buildings are real and not reproductions really brings it to life. Now this would have been a fairly wealthy person's home because of the size. Look at the high ceilings, it's pretty incredible. Normally the kitchens would be detached from the house because of fire, but this house had a fire pit right in the middle. And this is what they would call a curfew pot. They'd put this on at the end of the day to cover up the fire to, um, for safety reasons, basically. Now it must have been really cold in here. No curtains, no glass. But the windows were shuttered. So when it got too windy, they could shut this like that. Now, this is a two bedroom, so let me show you the bedrooms. Watch your step. Now this would be, I'm assuming, a child's bedroom, second family member, and the master, upstairs. It's steep. Over here is the bed. storage chest, hope chest. Now the bed is made of a straw tack mattress stuffed with straw down here. It's a little scratchy, but it's soft. Let's make that bed up for him again. Okay, you can close these for, for warmth, but over here as well, the shutters are vertical. They're heavy and you can tie them up like that and try and keep some of the wind out. There's holes in the floorboard down here that I'm sure it got really cold in here. Right in front of you here, let me come around, that's a kid bed, like a nursery, a little kid, a tr trundle, yeah, just like we have today. Let's sleep right here. But my favorite room is right behind you. It's the toilet. Obviously a favorite with the kids. Come on out, <laughs> let them have a look. Go ahead. Seems like even the wealthy had a cold and Spartan lifestyle. Pretty incredible, huh? You know, I could live here if it had cable TV. But the open air museum is more than just buildings. It showcases many professions that commoners would have held in the 17th and 18th centuries, from farming to milling and blacksmithing. One of the most interesting things about these demonstrations is that they try to keep it as historically accurate as possible. Now, the blacksmith's job is too dangerous for a child, but supervised cooking isn't. What are we making today? We're making excellent smock cake. It's a Tudor recipe, we believe. It's something that you might have had on your naming day once a year, on your birthday. All right, we're going to use that spoon. The kitchen utensils and the recipes they're creating are from about 1594. Thankfully, they have a chef to help us along the way with these unfamiliar tools. Actually, once you get the hang of things, it's not that hard. All right, now we're going to go and put this on the griddle on the fire. And after 10 minutes, we're enjoying the fruits of our labor.
Here's a tip. Take advantage of your hotel concierge before you arrive by emailing or calling ahead for theater tickets, tours, and restaurant reservations. Laura McKenzie's Traveler. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And for more information on Great Britain, go to lauramackenzietv.com. The English countryside has so much to offer. Historical villages that can really come alive to fairy tale castles that make reality almost a fantasy. Wow, this is exactly what you expect to see when you come to England. In fact, I almost expect to see a dragon come right out of the moat, huh? Thanks for joining me. Be sure to join me again next time from another terrific place somewhere else around the world. From the English countryside, I'm Laura McKenzie. Bye-bye.